Ça peut. Oh là là. Okay, so welcome everybody to Vibe um, in Moi Wo on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So we, have, this is going out on Facebook Live, so if you don't want your images on Facebook Live, don't go anywhere near Les, because we're going to follow him. <laughs> uh, there's a camera there, there's a camera there, and try not to get in, in anywhere near them. Uh, it's probably about a year or so, maybe a year and a half actually, before since Les was here last, and he did a great presentation on a small band of men, and uh, <laughs> we won't say any more than that. Uh, I'm going to. And anyway, a little bit about me. So I, you know, I, I moved house recently, and um, now I find that I can get Dave on my TV. So I've been doing a lot of watching Jeremy Clarkson and. Um, Top Gear. So today I'm going to introduce Les in the style of Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Les Bird. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, last time I spoke here was about well, 18 months ago and uh, talking about my book. I'm just going to check the, na uh, the name, uh, a, a Small Band of Men, because those of you who weren't here were um, Gary, what's your name again? Gary, Gary, yeah, yeah. Gary introduced <laughs> it as a, 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 a band of small men, <laughs> which took about 10 minutes to sort of die down Can't before I could actually <laughs> start the talk. So I was expecting you to introduce yeah. um, along the southern boundary as north to northwest or <laughs> along yeah. the western frontier or e e e trick there, e east, <laughs> east of Eden or something like yeah, that. East yeah. of Eden, yeah. 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 Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so. Basically, this book came out uh, last week. Um, it took me about a year to write, and the, the, the presentation today is about what's in that book. Um, obviously, the Vietnamese um, uh, era coming into Hong Kong. Um, but it's more or less, uh, it, it's more about the photographs that have gone in the book and how I managed to collect them together and put them, uh, uh, it's, it's quite a, a, a long story, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, I was a Marine police officer in Hong Kong uh, from 1976 to 1979. Uh, so I arrived the year after the end of the war in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, for the first 13 years of my service was dealing with the Vietnamese as they came in. Um, uh, during that time, I carried a, a camera in my kit bag. Um, and when circumstances allowed, uh, I would take a, a, a shot. And I kept these uh, photographs um, for 30 years without sort of looking at them much. And when I decided to write that book, I took them out and realized that by looking at photographs, you remember stories. And, and consequently, that book materialized. But I only used two photographs in that book. That's the one on the front cover and the one on the back. And so I had another 100 of them in this box. And I spoke to a publisher, uh, Pete Spurrier of Blacksmith books and we decided that there's probably enough material there to, to create a book. Um, but then Pete said, but with each photo there's a story and of course every, every photograph has a, a thousand words attached to it. So I sat down and started to write the stories behind each photograph and so the book grew um, uh, as, as, as it, uh, over the last year. But uh, with these photos um, I realized that there were gaps in my memory. So I started to communicate with my former colleagues who were scattered all over the world. Um, and they were coming back with stories about what happened to them. And I thought, well, this is remarkable too. I'll, I'm going to put that in the book. And then they said, by the way, I've got a few photos. Do you want to see them? I said, well, where are they? And they went up and scrambled around in their attics and, and got their photos. So I put together a portfolio of photographs from eight different people from all over the place. And these photographs, like this one, have never been seen before. And you can see the, how, how clear they are. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, 
the actual detail is actually quite quite interesting. You know, that that one there, um, these three guys coming in in a sailing boat. Um, obviously, they didn't come a thousand miles across the South, South China Sea in that, but they were making the last uh, last few miles in that. So there are quite a lot of like here. Um, they're on the stern deck of a police launch, having been rescued. These were. These last three were taken by a guy called Alistair Watson, who was a colleague of mine, um, Paul Jackson's, um, and he was a very keen photographer, and, and, Paul, and um, Alistair very kindly let me use these. But going back to the beginning, uh, this was probably the first photo I took um, of a Vietnamese boat, and I, I used um, an old Polaroid camera. I, I know Gary's got a lot of cameras around here. You haven't got a yeah, Polaroid. I haven't got a Polaroid, unfortunately. Uh, a Polaroid camera, I don't know if any of you remember, they used to be big black things and you, you press it, there was no aperture or anything, and you press a button and it used to whirl out on the side and you pull it out and there'd be that like darkroom moment when you would wait for a few seconds yeah. to find out what, what was going to, and you peel it off. And we had these cameras on board the police launch for evidence purposes. So if you got a smuggling case, you take a photograph of the evidence and then you stick it on your report. So I started to use it to take photographs of Vietnamese boats. Um, and that's another one um, that I took. D DN stands for Da Nang, uh, that, which is where that boat came from. Um, and so I took quite a few actually using that camera. This one is just south of Lanto Island. Um, and it's a, it's a different style of boat, as you can see, it's a sailing boat. And there were, there were 153 people on that. These last three photos were taken in 1977 when the, the influx of Vietnamese was actually a more of a trickle. I think in 1977 there was only about a thousand Vietnamese arrived in Hong Kong. When you compare that with the fact that there were 210,000 actually arrived in Hong Kong uh, over that, the next 20 years, 1977 was actually a a very quiet year, which is why I could do things like this and and uh, and, and get away with it. But um, as things went on, um, it became a bit more serious. Now that, that, that's another great shot, I think. Um, and he chose the guy in the in the bow um, with the rope. He's been told, obviously, to to get ready to come alongside. And you can see how crowded it is at the back. Yeah, there's a lot of kids, a lot of kids in this. You see someone's, someone's lying down there quite ill. Um, we had a lot of illness to deal with um, for those first few boats. But um, this photograph is one of my, my own. Um, and I, I put that in because it really, it really does give it a good example of the type of boat that was coming in in the early 70s. This is a river boat. If, if you know South Vietnam, South Vietnam is make, made up mostly of the Mekong Delta, so it's a, a maze of rivers and swamps and, 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 uh, and waterways. And the boats that these people were using to, to, get, to get out were what, whatever was available. So they were, they were actually going to sea in river boats, which was really, really not, not the thing to do. The, a, a river boat like that would have a flat keel. That means underneath the water, instead of being V-shaped, it's completely flat, which means if you get hit by a wave, it basically just turns straight over. Um, and overloaded, you can see the state of the wood. Here it's all broken, uh, rotting, um, engine would be breaking down. Quite often we would leave Hong Kong waters to go and, and, and rescue people like this who just couldn't get any further. But the, I, I left that photograph in. It's not very clear, but it's just typifies the type of boat that was coming in at that time. Um, this is a better shot from Alistair Watson again, um, showing, um, I, I guess they put the cover up there. If you think about it, if you go out during the summer at, at sea um, f and you stay out there in the sun for maybe two or three weeks, you can imagine what, what condition you'd be in. Um, they were usually very, very dehydrated. different types of boats. Um, the one on the right, the, the, 
we did occasionally get the, the, the sailing boats come in and they, they were more uh, suited to open water. But again, usually very, very overcrowded. So that what was happening actually, just to sort of go back and talk about the, the actual situation in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, the southern boundary is uh, uh, what I refer to in the title is that horizontal black line along the bottom, which is a, a line of latitude. Um, and the, the black square is Hong Kong territorial waters inside. So our jurisdiction was inside that square. And the Vietnamese boats were predominantly at that time coming up from the south southwest. Uh, so we would put our launches alongside, like goalkeepers, alongside the uh, along the line there, along the southern boundary, and wait for them to come in. <coughs> yeah, Sokos. Yeah, it's a popular spot. And the, these next two shots are the type of boats we were using at the time. Uh, that's police launch number one. That's our command launch. Uh, it's quite a big boat antiquated. Uh, all our launches were very, very old in those days, so th they weren't really um, suitable for this sort of thing. But what you're seeing here is a, a Winchex uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, Royal Auxiliary Air Force doing a, bringing someone down to pick up a sick person. This is an exercise, not a real case, but if, if um, a refugee needed um, medical the treatment immediately. We, we would call the uh, the Augsie Air Force and they would come out and winch the person up and take them straight to hospital. So Police Launch 1 used to sit on point round about the Sokos and Cheung Chow and command the deployment of the other police launches such as that one. That's my own boat uh, when I was first here in 1977. Um, that's my own boat escorting a, uh, a Vietnamese boat into Hong Kong. Uh, you can see it's quite small, the patrol boat, the police boat is quite small. Um, very little deck space, so if that boat was in trouble, how do we, how do we rescue them? Um, it, it proved quite difficult in those early days in order to, um, uh, to accommodate. If you, if you imagine there was 200 people in the water or, or, or a vessel about to sink, we'd have to take people on board these small boats, small patrol launches. So uh, in, in the 70s it was... Uh, Although we were very experienced in search and rescue, which is our primary role, um, uh, trying to deal with a lot of boats or a lot of people at, in one go was actually quite difficult. We did actually get these Zodiacs uh, in early 1980, um, a fleet of Zodiacs, which were, were very, very useful. We used them to um, shepherd in the boats towards P Police Launch 1 so that they could, they could, PL1 could stay stationary and then the Zodiacs would go out and uh, escort boats in to be, um, to be treated. The, 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 the stuff we had uh, available to us in those days, there was no, no such thing as GPS, right? So uh, the way we used to uh, navigate was using a, a radar system. Um, the radar would stay on 24 hours a day. And using the radar, you can look 20 miles in the distance and you can see a moving target, which would be usually what we're looking for, obviously, is Vietnamese boats coming in. And having, having a 20-mile um, radius gave us the time to prepare. So we would watch them coming in. If they stopped, they were probably in trouble, we'd go out and help them. Um, but it gave us the time to prepare uh, as we watched the flotilla coming in. Th this... Uh, slide here, I put this here to show you how really antiquated our our methods were. Um, when I was at the um, Marine Police Training School in the Marine Department, I was actually taught how to navigate using the calipers and the chart, no GPS, so you would need a sextant and you'd need to be able to read the sun movement and the stars and I was actually taught uh, Morse code, believe it or not. Um, so I can swear in Morse code still, <laughs> that's about it all now. And uh, also we were taught flag semaphore, which is how to signal using flags. So just in case you know, I was transported back to Lord Nelson's time, I could actually sort of, I could, re I could read, you know, England expects every man to, 
to you know, whatever. Anyway, so uh, it, yeah, but that, that's a, that's where we were in the 1970s. Um, uh, it was a it, it was it was pretty basic stuff. Uh, we did have uh, equipment like this. Uh, these two photographs are quite interesting, I suppose. That w in both in both of them, there's the grappling net. You can see it's a very basic piece of equipment. It's just ropes tied together. It's like f ten rope ladders, and we just throw them over the side. Uh, and this this helped us an awful lot in dealing with two moving boats uh, in rough seas. Uh, it it helped to do things like that that's in the in those two photographs. I'm telling the story about um, uh, like what happened in the Marine Police back then with the Vietnamese, but this is predominantly a, a, a display of these photographs because I think they, they are quite quite good and uh, they do reflect what was happening. I see this guy's actually found himself some plastic gloves and this guy's got uh, engineer's gloves on. So um, people are starting to be aware of the fact that they needed to protect themselves against um, uh, sort of large numbers of people who've been exposed to various things. Um, talking about the history, when, when people started to leave Vietnam uh, in 1975, the first place they went to was Thailand. Most, most tried to go by sea. The northern border with China was already closed, so most people tried to leave by sea to the south. Uh, Thailand is the 300 miles, it was obviously the, the easiest way, you would always choose the, the shortest route, um, but unfortunately the Gulf of Thailand became a, a haven for pirates um, and the, the refugees, the, the Vietnamese were easy pickings because they were carrying whatever they had in gold um, and so Thai pirates were, were, became prevalent in that area and so people started to go to Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Philippines and then of course in 1979 Samari McElhose um, declared Hong Kong as a port of first asylum and the United Nations set up their office in Hong Kong and it be Hong Kong became the stepping stone for these people to find their way to the west. Um, Hong Kong was never the de destination of choice um, they all wanted to go to the States, to Canada, to Australia, to the UK, to Euro Europe. Um, and so Hong Kong set itself up, um, it put its hand up actually at that time, which was very, very good. Um, so people knew that they could, that the boat people knew that they could come to Hong Kong and get a fair, a fair hearing, if you like. Um, and if there were refugees, then they would be passed on by the uh, United Nations to third countries. So. Although this start was at the beginning, this type of thing here, by 1979, everybody was going that way, everyone. And that took us and the Marine Police by surprise because um, whereas we had a thousand Vietnamese arrive in 1979, in 19, sorry, 1977, in 1979, um, we had 70,000 arrive. Um, so we were absolutely over, well, we were flooded and we, we had difficulty um, uh, coping with it. But if you can imagine, if you're a father taking your boat out to sea with your kids and you're coming from a, a country that's just been at war, um, you would probably be able to lay your hands on a weapon. Um, and most of the boats had weapons on them, which they would ditch when they saw us. Or they didn't want to jeopardize their um, status as refugees so they would throw throw the guns or whatever they were carrying overboard but not all and um, that's a Russian made uh, hand grenade it's live and the pin's still in it and that was handed to my colleague Alistair Watson um, and after he'd had a, a little bit of a heart attack he took a photograph <laughs> um, quite often these guys would just hand up guns um, and uh, you know it was thanks very much uh, just don't point it at me um, but yeah, you can understand that they would protect themselves, and I would have done the same. I would, if I was going on a boat across the ocean, I, I'd probably carry a gun as well if I was taking my kids with me. So 1979 was very, very busy. 
Um, and I put this slide together just to show you, you notice children. You know, there was, I, I think probably almost 50% of the arrivals in 79 were kids. But it, 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 was, it, was not, it wasn't just children. You can see in the top right hand corner there, there's granddad. You know, quite often the, the, um, they would come in families. So, you know, they would flee the country with uh, everybody, you know, take everybody and everything that you could carry. This next one. Now, th this is actually water. This is not land. Th these are boats in a queue in government dockyard. So after we, we, we intercepted them out on the southern boundary, our job was to bring them in to the government dockyard. And this awning here is where the uh, medical and immigration officers sat. And this is an orderly, this is an orderly queue. So you've got, you've got each boat would come in, it would be given a number painted on the side in white and then they would be put to the back of the queue. So each boat would be called, called forward and the people would be interviewed. So you could sit in, they, they could sit in government. Government dockyard, by the way, was in Yamati, which is only about a mile from the Star Ferry on Kowloon side. So if, you, if the picture could sort of be lifted up, you could see Hong Kong Island just over there in the Star Ferry just going. So all this was going on um, uh, in the harbor, in the inner harbor. Um, and. Uh, I've got a figure up there, 9,000. That, that was the number of people we had in there on the, <coughs> if I remember, the 10th of June, 1979. I remember that date because on that day, 4,516 people arrived on that one day. So um, I, I could, don't know, I can't remember how many boats they were in, but it must have been about 30 or 40 different boats with 4,500 people coming in in one day. So this was probably taken round about that time when, when they were waiting for their chance to be interviewed. This is a government photograph, not one of mine. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of people coming in on that year. But then, um, two, two months later, we had Typhoon Hope, which was a super typhoon. Uh, it was the biggest typhoon in Hong Kong since uh, Typhoon Rose in 71. Typhoon Hope actually killed 100 people in Hong Kong, nothing to do with the boat people. Uh, it was so strong. Um, and it came across the South China Sea, as, uh, sorry, it came across the Pacific as they normally would the route. It was a direct hit on Hong Kong. Um, and um, it then turned and went straight across the South China Sea, which was where the Vietnamese boats, if you remember those flimsy little boats that were coming in. So for two weeks after that, um, we went from 4,000 on the 10th of June to the zero. So for two weeks, there was no one arrived at all, nothing. There was no boats arrived. So <laughs> you have a guess, have a guess, nothing. Nothing arrived, nothing. So whoever was out there in those boats uh, never made it, I guess. Back to uh, this, I wanted to show you this again because uh, at that time we were just about managing to, to cope, we were just coping with the amount of people that were coming in. But the government in their wisdom decided to um, uh, increase, uh, by this time by the way I was a senior inspector and I was actually the operational commander of the area and I was really grateful for the, for the government because they decided they wanted to give me some assistance by diverting boats from other government departments to help. Um, and so I got the Chop Yat, which is a, 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 a marine department tug, yeah, and it, it did five knots. <laughs> uh, and it rarely went for more than about half an hour before it broke down. There was the Tin Hao. I, I can't remember where that came from. Uh, but anyway, they gave us that. And that's the Successor Clemente, which was the uh, the Taipo district officers run around and he used to hold his monthly meetings on that anyway so he was told to give us that boat and it came with a rosewood meeting table in the back and the, in the in the boardroom which was really useful for dealing with uh, Vietnamese refugees <laughs> um, and 
and there was another boat called uh, oh, it was an environmental protection boat I remember which was deployed from Deep Bay it was on so, sort of com some kind of oyster bed investigation so when it arrived it took us a week to get all the oyster shells off the boat <laughs> to clean it up but like you know the chop yacht would it, it made a whole new um, thing for me in, in terms of management. Uh, the chop yacht would be given the duty of escorting all the Vietnamese boats to the government dockyard. It would sail off and then half an hour later it would say we've broken down and then we have to go and rescue that one. <laughs> so yeah, so it, it, as you can imagine, that, that era, that year was quite, quite busy. But we were managing until um, the big ships started to arrive. Um, now this is the Hoi Phong. Uh, in early 1979, uh, a people smuggling racket began in in uh, Vietnam, and uh, their their ploy was to hire a Vietnamese, uh, sorry, a, a Taiwanese crew, put them on a, a, a freighter like that, this about 3,500 tons, um, and then put 3,000 3,600 refugees on it or people and then sail it to Hong Kong and on the way say that the master would send a message saying we've just rescued 3,500 people in the South China Sea, they're all on little boats, I'm bringing them in, they're all refugees. But a quick check on that, uh, we found out that, that that was part of the people smuggling racket. Uh, and so this boat actually was stopped by us on the southern boundary whilst the investigation started. I think you can see it's a tanker. Is that, yeah, you can see just see the anchor chain. So that, that, that is just south of Potoi. Um, and you can see the state of it. The, the 3,500, 3,600 people crammed into the cargo holds. That it didn't have a cargo, which was, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a giveaway. You know, what, what are you doing in the South China Sea <laughs> with no cargo? Um, so they didn't really think that one through. Uh, it, Interestingly, I mean, the, the, uh, I, I cut this one quite short. Uh, it, the end story was the Hong Kong government just couldn't let them just sit there. The, we had to take them. But the, the, the state of the people on board was awful. They'd been in the, the, the holds uh, for a month. There were no toilets. Um, people had vomited. They were just sitting in whatever they, uh, you know, the smell was absolutely awful. So even though the government didn't want to take the boat in because it would set a precedence and we thought that if, if we did then there would be more ships um, but at the end of the day we just had to take them in. It, uh, one interesting person that was on board, it was a, a, a major in the South Vietnamese Army, his name da David Tran and he back home in Vietnam uh, he managed to stay and not get detected for three years and managed to get on board this but when he was at home, his hobby was making uh, spicy sauce, uh, chili sauce, and um, he was identified by the Americans as a person of interest because he was a major, and he, he was given refugee status and taken to the States. And he started to make the sauce again in his, his kitchen at home um, uh, because he didn't like the bland uh, Western food. And uh, he started to bottle it, and he, he, named, he named his company the Hui Fong sauce company and he, his, his sauce is called Siracha. Siracha? Siracha. Siracha, thank you. Uh, he may, he's a, well, he's a, he's a billionaire um, now anyway, but he was on that boat and he was dressed in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and that was it. And uh, it, 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 actually that, that, that tells you just what, what type of people were coming. Um, although they looked pretty ragged um, you know, they were basically the middle classes who could afford to pay on these big boats. But once we got rid of this, oh, oh you know, this is, this is actually, I wanted to show you this. I just put this in this morning, I forgot it was in. Uh, this is the Wei Fong, this is the same ship, this is the stern. You can see the name Fong, it's Panama, Panamanian registered. Uh, police launch one sat alongside the Wei Fong for a month whilst it was out there, and of course, you know, you take photos, and uh, I took that one uh, of those two kids. So that's 1979, so they'd be in their 40s or 50s now. I thought it was quite a nice little shot, the way the bamboo is coming across. But that was followed by this. So it did set a precedent, and they thought 
people smugglers thought that they could get away with it, and they tried again with this one. This, this had 2,600 on board, Skylock. Everybody knows the story about that. Uh, it, it stayed at anchor for five months whilst the government tried to figure out what to do with it. Again, we knew it was people smuggling. Um, and eventually, of course, the, the refugees on board cut the anchor chain and it ran aground on, on Lama Island. Um, and we managed to get, well, half of them actually run, run, run away on Lama Island. And it, took, it took a week to find them all. Uh, and uh, the rest of them we had to evacuate off the ship because that, that's what happened to it. it. It actually sank after running aground. It was broken up. Um, there's one uh, last people smuggling ship I'd like to uh, tell you about because it's, it's relative to it's close to here. This is Loke 1, the beach uh, down the southwest of Lantau Island. Um, there was no path in those days, I believe there's a path now. But this, the, this road here is the South Lantau Road. And in on the 26th of May, 1979, I was driving a police uh, Land Rover along the road there when I got an, um, a radio call saying there was something going on in Low K1. And what had happened is this third people <laughs> smuggling boat, I'm going to show you the photographs of it in a minute, had come in via Macau and the crew had decided we didn't, we didn't want to get arrested in Hong Kong. They took their gold and got into a small boat and disappeared into Macau. And they said to the refugees, there's Hong Kong in front of you. Just carry on in that way and you'll be fine. So they got this far, realizing that they didn't know how to stop the boat. So they turned, for, for Jacko's uh, benefit, turned to port. <laughs> and they turned left. and. And, and stopped the boat by ramming the whole boat right up the beach. So when I arrived, you'll see the photo in a minute, the, 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 the Senon, it was called the Senon, and it had 1,403 people, uh, was rammed straight up the beach. And I came through this foliage, uh, not knowing what to find, and found myself on my own on this beach with 1,400 people in a, in a capsized boat. The Marine police were coming up behind, um, and uh, the first thing I did was to try and herd everyone together mm -hmm. and try and keep them because I didn't know if the, if the crew were still on board. I assumed that the crew had mingled in. And, uh, and so for that first 10 or 15 minutes, um, it was quite interesting. But when, once the, the following up Marine police came, I, I managed to grab the Polaroid camera from, uh, from one of the sergeants and I took that photo. Uh, now, I know it's pretty awful, but uh, it's the only one I've got. And I took the photo and put the, pho I I put the photo in my pocket and then forgot about it. And it got damaged by the water. Uh, but you can see there's still people falling over, the, jumping over the side there, down, down a broken ladder. Um, these are the, the people who've already got off. They're predominantly young single men who, who were fit enough to get off. What I found later in the hold were all the uh, the older, the women and children, people who were too sick to move. And what the problem was, you can see it's tilting over to the right-hand side. So we were actually very concerned that this was actually in a capsize, even though it was aground. Um, so it was actually quite a dramatic moment, but I just managed to take that and, and chuck the Polaroid camera back to the sergeant. Um, and by chance, the, the photograph survived. Um, and that, that I took later, after everyone had moved. Uh, so that, that shows you the ship itself. But it's interesting that from, from that ship, there was, it's mentioned, by the way, that ship is mentioned in this book. And a guy in the States who was on that ship, um, a refugee, read my book. And before I wrote that one, he got in touch. Uh, here he is. This is Kang, my pen pal, lives in California. Uh, he was on the ship and he read the first book and he wrote to me and said, uh, uh, I, he actually said, I remember you. He said, there was only one white man sort of running up and down the beach. Uh, and that, that must have been you, I suppose, because I've just read your book. And uh, so I was there. Uh, and he was a refugee on, on that boat. And he'd, he'd managed to stay undercover for three years in Saigon uh, without getting arrested. Um, by the North Vietnamese, the new regime, and uh, 
he got refugee status. And uh, he then um, started to introduce me halfway through writing this book. I, I, it, it occurred to me that I didn't know the stories of the refugees. What happened to them? Why did they leave their country? Why, what made them leave? And what happened to them and their journey? And what happened to them in Hong Kong in the camps? We didn't know because we were out meeting them, um, doing our first aid bit, rescuing, and then passing them on. There was no time to sit down and say, well, tell, you know, where did you come from? Tell me your life story. It was too busy. So I realized that I actually didn't know anything about what, what happened to them. So he said, well, I can introduce you to, to other people who would like to talk to you. So he did. And th this is Caroline Wu. Um, Caroline is living in California. She's been very, very good. Um, and uh, her, she told me her story. She was um, very, very young, obviously, and uh, got separated from her parents, had nothing when she arrived. And her first night in the camp um, that she was sent to, it was, it was, it was actually, um, I think it was Chima uh, Wan, her first night in the camp, she said she was absolutely terrified. And suddenly a huge gang fight uh, occurred. And it was not north versus south. It was, it was um, just two villages, rival villages, gangs, who'd made homemade weapons. And they just started to attack each other. So her first night in the camp um, was quite quite dramatic, and she's still traumatized by it. But she she had the the, the strength to 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 write her story down, and I put it in the book with her permission. So, you know, getting to the end of of that particular era, um, they were still coming. By you know, 1979, very very busy. Um, but we, we were just managing and the people smuggling had been eradicated, so that was good. Uh, statistics wise, you can see there, I talked about 1977, you can see along the bottom there the, the, the years. 1977, really quiet year to begin with. Then 1979, after the Hong Kong, Hong Kong had, um, <laughs> I think that's the next slide, sorry, it's got volume on it. Um, 1979, um, after Hong Kong declared itself a port of first asylum, uh, it attracted everybody. They all they all came at that, the, during that year, and then the the West started to be more selective. Um, uh, these people were coming to Hong Kong. Some of them were refugees, fleeing for um, you know persecution or f fearing of for their lives, and other people weren't. People we, were sort of realizing that if they got to Hong Kong they might get refugee status and they, they were classified as economic migrants so Hong Kong be, in 1980 Hong Kong started to become had to become more selective in what they did with people um, because the West was simply refusing to take them um, and so the camps were starting to fill up so in 1980 1981 um, a segregation policy was announced in Hong Kong and um, people were divided what you were either a refugee or you were an economic migrant classified eventually as an illegal immigrant uh, it was difficult difficult choice but there was nowhere for them to go no one wanted them um, and, and Vietnam wouldn't take them back so Vietnam was still like there's nothing wrong over here it's all your problem um, so uh, it, it was very very difficult for everyone so the numbers dropped for a few reasons one the word got back to Vietnam that you wouldn't automatically get refugee status if you arrived in Hong Kong. And the Hong Kong government did that in a couple of ways. One initiative was to broadcast daily in Vietnamese on RTHK because um, in Vietnam people would listen to RTHK. They would try and get news of the, the situation in Hong Kong and then decide on whether they were going to come. Um, and uh, so it was broadcast every every every. I think every hour for a while, um, a, a, an announcement in Vietnamese saying, don't come, you know, uh, and that had an effect. But the, all, uh, the other thing we did, we were given a performer. I'm going to show you what, what, what happens in a minute. We were given a performer which said in Vietnamese and in English and Chinese, which we had to give on the southern boundary to every Vietnamese boat, read this. If you want to come into Hong Kong, you might be not might not be classified as a refugee. You might be actually have to go into a closed camp 
for an indefinite period of time, it's really up to you. If you want to come in, you can come in. If you want to carry on, you're free to go, basically, right? So it was a deterrent. So I'm going to try and play this. I hope it works. So that, that was a presentation of the detention notice. And that's actually a copy of the, the detention notice that we used to give them. Uh, it's a tough decision, as you can see. They're out on, in the middle of the ocean after probably a two or three week journey, uh, thinking, not really knowing what was going to happen to them. And then suddenly they're being given this, this notice. It's a tough call, tough times. But back to this. Uh, so what happened, as you can see, the deterrent effect worked up until 1998, 1980, 1988 and 1989, when the criminal gangs in, in Vietnam started to get on their people smuggling rackets again. And instead of using freighters, they started to supply the refugees with, with wooden boats. And we started to see a huge amount of, of, of activity again. And in those two years, you can see there's almost 54,000 people arrived, all duped, all believing that they were going to come to Hong Kong and be classified as refugees. And none of them were, none of them. They were, they were all, uh, no one was fleeing a war anymore. Uh, the United Nations had packed up and gone. Um, and Hong Kong was left uh, to deal with this. And uh, there's a refugee coordinator called Mike Hansen. And if any, any of you remember him, uh, he, he said on, on TV, he said, uh, this is no longer a refugee problem, this is a non-refugee problem, and it's our problem. Uh, and that basically summed it up. Um, so we had 54,000 people arrive in those two years, and they all went into closed camps. So we, we were left at the end of, of, of 89 with um, 60,000 people with nowhere to go. Um, the West didn't want them because they weren't refugees and we didn't know what to do with them. Um, meanwhile, there was negotiation, fortunately there was negotiations going on in Vietnam to, to bring them into line with the humanitarian crisis that was going on here and to stop them allowing people to leave like that. Um, and there was pressure, I'm talking politics a little bit, uh, there was pressure on the Vietnamese government um, by the Americans and the British on behalf of Hong Kong to recognize this and to start taking these people back because no one was going to take them. And that's when the repatriation of, of, of people from Hong Kong started um, to go back to Vietnam. And, and in the whole saga of 210,000 people coming to Hong Kong, uh, 70,000, mostly from those two years, went back. So a third, a third were repatriated. Awesome. Uh, initially, initially, I think on the first, very first attempt to get them. It was, a, it was a complete and utter balls up, to be honest. Uh, but eventually, uh, from, funnily enough, the, the, the number of Vietnamese I've spoken to in writing the book who've been willing to tell their story, a lot of them were the ones who were repatriated. I was really surprised. And uh, the, all I've got is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Hong Kong, for treating us so well while we were here. We were, I said, how long were you in the camp for? Seven years. Six years. Uh, I'm coming to that, yeah, yeah, but, but most of them were in camps for six to seven years. So you were getting kids arrive at, at, at sort of 12, 13 it's years. The whole schooling. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the whole youth, actually. The whole youth. Yeah. Um, so six to seven years was probably the average before um, the repatriation began. But as I say, it's quite, it's quite interesting that, that a lot of them hold no grudge at all, to, certainly not for Hong Kong. Um, everyone has said, every, every single person that's written to me has said thank you. 
you know, on behalf of us, to you, meaning Hong Kong, not me, yeah, yeah. to Hong Kong, uh, we really appreciate what you did for us. It's, 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 quite, it's quite staggering that you would write to someone who, who you've been incarcerated for six, seven years to say thanks. Amazing. Anyway, bringing on to your subject, yeah, uh, in, in 1989, uh, Hong Kong was running out of room to keep them. There were, there were already 13 camps with 60,000 people. And on, in June 1989, uh, we were still on the southern boundary meeting these boats coming in. And the order was, the camps are full. You've got to keep them out on the southern boundary. And we said, well, how are we going to do that? They're, they're, they're coming in on a 1,000 a day. And they said, well, put them in the bay. There's a bay in Dia Chow. Uh, this is a recent photograph. Um, uh, but in, in 1989, that, that, that scar in the middle wasn't there. So no one was living on Dia Chow at the time. Um, and so we started to put the boats in that bay and in the first day we had a thousand people on about 20 different boats in that bay and I was saying what what are we going to do with them now what do you want us to do with them and they said well give us give us a couple of days we need to sort out that what's happening in the camps there's no more movements because Whitehead um, had, had been rioting they've been rioting um, in several of the camps and the government has said there's no more movement so we were asked to just keep them there which, um, if you look at it, where it is, everybody knows where the Sokos is. So Dia Chow is down there. It's quite a remote um, position. Uh, there was no, on the island, there was no fresh water, there was no food. There was no power, so no lights, and there was no sanitation. But to try and keep people on their boats, after about five or six days in that bay, the boat started to sink. I'm sure the refugees were, uh, sorry, they weren't refugees, but I'm sure the Vietnamese started to sink their own boats in, in the hope of, of being allowed to land, and they were. So on, I think on day, day three or day four, we, we had to allow them ashore. And these photographs were taken by myself and my colleague, Stephen Took, uh, and uh, this is t these are taken in the first week of Dia Chow. So here we're, we're, there's a derelict house on, on the pier, it used to be. Uh, here, this is the office, this is the blue awning, there's a chair you can see and a table. Um, we're sitting in here trying to document all these people, so what we're trying to do is replicate what was going on in government dockyard. Um, this is the bay, that when you go into Dia Chow, this is the bay, uh, this is the pier, people queuing to come in. Uh, bottom right, people waiting to be told what to do. Uh, interesting shot on the top right hand corner, you can see the guys in the foreground, um, of course, uh, in 1989 a lot of regiments in the uh, North Vietnamese army were demobilized, which left thousands and thousands of former battle-hardened soldiers with nothing to do. So they thought, well, we'll try to go to Hong Kong and become a ref refugee. And uh, these guys here at, uh, in the foreground were, were um, former soldiers. Um, and it, we could always recognize the soldiers, not only because of the way they looked. Once they got on the island, they would bivouac into the, into the, into the island and, and build the best, the best accommodation. Um, they would always have their own, their own, their own stuff. Um, and and these, these are two groups. There are Peter Connolly, my, my, uh, my other colleague, took these. You can see that the makeup of the, uh, the boatloads of people are different. Um, you, you don't see many families there. You see these guys here dressed in their, in their uniform. Some of them made no attempt to hide the fact that they were, they were soldiers who had just left. So on the island of Dia Chow at the time, there was no segregation, remember? So we had families, we had former soldiers, a lot of young men. A lot of young women, um, and uh, at night time with no power, there was no lights. So, for that first few weeks, it became quite difficult to uh, to control. This is some of the accommodation that they built for themselves. You can it doesn't really take me to to explain what's going on here. You can see the using sail. Uh, family wedged into a rock. Um, that was probably the second week up top right hand corner you can see there's tents. The British Army uh, delivered some tents in that second week. The bottom here, um, that's a father who's built his own 
cage to keep his family in as a form of protection at night. So that really exemplifies what, what the situation was like. It's quite tough. And of course there were millions of ch kids. Uh, well actually there weren't many kids, but wherever we walked around, the, like the Pied Piper on the island would be followed, <laughs> be followed, and every time you turn around this would happen. <laughs> um, of course, for them, I guess it was a game. Uh, but a lot of these kids spent seven years on that island. A lot of people who arrived on the island actually never left until they were repatriated seven years later. So, you know, th these kids would, would, would go from the age of, what, five until their teens. Uh, living on Daya Chao. And a lot of them were put in here. This is the camp that was built on Daya Chao. Uh, this is the first attempt uh, a year after those photographs were taken. That wasn't considered enough, so the government built this one in 1992, and that was a 10,000 seater. Uh, I think 9,400 was the, the, the maximum amount of people that, that were in there. And that's the middle of Daya Chao, the, the, if you know Daya Chao, uh, that, that's in between the two hills. Uh, and that was demolished and emptied in 1996. And that's what it looks like now. Or rather, that's what it looked like before that last typhoon wrecked it again. Uh, but that's the middle of the island, basically. Um, getting to the end now, you'd be glad to hear. Um, and uh, the uh, just one quick shot of another camp. This is this is an interesting camp. Uh, Daya Chao actually got full, <coughs> so the government came up with an idea to use four Hong Kong Yamati ferries. They're over in the right-hand corner and tie them up alongside uh, Stonecutters Island. Stonecutters Island is right in the middle of the harbour. You probably know it. It's not an island anymore. It's they've, they've filled it in. But uh, in those days, there was a, an open piece of land about the size of two football pitches. And they put four of those ferries alongside. They took all the seats out. So the people lived inside the ferries at night. And then um, they, they sat outside during the day. And this is a feeding queue inside the camp. They put barbed wire around the camp. And it, it housed just 2,000 people. And this was like a stepping stone Initially, a, a lot of the people I've spoken to said, I, I lived in the ferries for a week. Do you, do you remember the ferries? So I sent them these photographs and they said, yeah, that's the ones. <laughs> we, lived, we lived in there for two or three days before being moved onto a bigger camp. So this was like a stepping stone. And these photographs were taken by the camp commandant, Ian Clark. Uh, he's got an interesting story. I'll, yeah, all right, I'll just tell you his story. He, he joined Marine in that year, 1988, and he'd been in Marine about a week, and he'd been on the boat about two days, and he'd never seen a, a refugee, never seen a Vietnamese boat, and he got a call saying, we need you to go to Stonecutters Island, and we need you to open a camp for 2,000 people with four ferries and, um, and, and some barbed wire, basically, and you to get on with it. And that was his job, and uh, he did that for about a year, and um, and he took those photographs. Uh, but it was a, uh, it, 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 it's interesting that people were coming in after the South China, uh, South China Sea, and being put straight into this camp where they could see Central and 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 Western. Um, so it was like, well, we've made it, but we haven't. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to finish off, uh, the book uh, has thrown up uh, a lot of interesting, writing this book has thrown up a lot of interesting things. Certainly a big surprise for me was the, um, the connections and the involvement with the Vietnamese people that, that uh, were willing, very willing to talk. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, uh, it was a case of this is the first time we've told anyone this. I, I guess, you know, it's a bit like, you know, your dad never told you what happened during the war. So these people went through this, this era and then have told no one. And, and now somebody has said, I was there as well and I'm writing about it. And it's been an opportunity for them to write about it. And a lot of people have been very open with what, 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 what they went through. 
and I, I managed to put it all in the book with their permission. And this, that, that's, that's him, that's Kang, that's his wife Yen, she was also a refugee, she was on the same ship, the Senon. They just got married the week before and made a break for it, uh, and that's them in California. And that's a guy who writes to me now, um, it's quite nice. And uh, the other, my other mate over on the right hand side is Bao, Bao Vu, uh, lives in London. Um, and he wrote and said, look, uh, we don't have any photos of our youth. <laughs> Would you like to try and find some for me? And so I went to the government offices and uh, I, found, I found them in Hailing Chow um, in, in 1980, 1984. Um, and this picture he took himself of the photo, he'd had these framed in London and they hang up in one of his shops. He has a, three shops in London. Uh, there he is, handsome man. Uh, uh, so uh, he's another mate I found. Um, so yeah, those stories have gone in the book as well. So there we are. Done. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Outstanding and very moving as well. Um, we can take just a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah. So, anybody yeah, got a good was question? To what was roughly the population of Hong Kong then at the end of the 70s? Uh, for 4.4 million. Okay. You talk about the southern border. Um, so, there's all the other islands there besides the Sokos. Yeah. Shekwe Chow, yeah. Chung Chow, and you mentioned Hailing Chow. So, yeah. were there other stories of them making it? By you guys at night, at night time and oh, sometimes, yeah. So, yeah. With all those, with all those boats coming in, um, particularly in 1979, we were really running run ragged by the the amount of boats. So sometimes they would get through, yeah, and land, um, and then we'd get told off, and you know, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> what were you doing all but night? You know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Th these people weren't running away. Um, they, they wanted to be, you know. We're here, you know. They, they just they, they just didn't know where they were, and they just accidentally just missed missed us. Uh, maybe you know we were doing something else. Yeah, but Hailing Chow and Seku Chow were used as um, detention centres. Really? Hmm. Seku, the, the drug rehabilitation centre on Seku Chow, well, half of it was was made into a. This is how uh, how hard pressed Hong Kong was to find room for everyone. We had 14 camps spread out all over the, all over Hong Kong, and Seku Chow and Hailing Chow were both refugee camps. If you go to Seku Chow, I don't know if it's still there. They may have knocked it down. The buildings that were used, they were specially built buildings. So there was a drug rehabilitation centre which was used temporarily to start with, and then they built some uh, Nissan hut type type of accommodation and used there. So they're all over the place. Okay, so we take another couple. Okay, two two parts less. Um, is there any um, record of how many boats made the attempt and didn't mm. get there? Yeah. Any idea of the numbers? Yeah. Um, obviously, there are no, well, not obviously, but there are no records in Vietnam as to how many people. Yeah, sure. If you go to Vietnam and start talking about this, people go, oh, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. What What era? What uh, The official story is what era? Uh, the, 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 the people who are back in Vietnam now have been talking to me. I've had to change all their names in the book. Um, uh, because the <laughs> really it didn't yeah yeah they're scared yeah not even today um, so to answer your question there are no official records as to how many people left the official record is zero um, nobody left uh, there are records of how many people arrived uh, in Hong Kong is 210,000 uh, around Southeast Asia it, it sort of varies just over a million uh, yeah. okay. people who arrived who arrived, really? yeah, mm. uh, and the, the the guesstimate of how many people who didn't make it is about the same. So the, there aren't no figures, but the, the 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 best guess is that half didn't make it by sea. So quite possibly a million Second people. Part, I was going to ask you, yeah. Can you put any comparison stroke? thought to what's happening in English Channel from... Um, well, you know, the movement of people across the ocean um, and uh, across fleeing from war uh, has been going on, you know, since time immemorial, I yeah. suppose. 
I mean, my expertise was there. I was there um, at that time, which is why I've sort of put my head up and wrote the book, because I, I can speak about it, but can try to make a comparison with what's going on now. Not really. I don't really know much about it. Well, I do. I mean, I, re I read the same as you in the news. But um, try putting to sea in a boat when you don't know anything about a boat, you can't swim, uh, it's pretty desperate. There are even times when the smugglers come in, the smuggler people from France are saying it's a lake. <laughs> and I really wanted to ask you, uh, could you compare the journey from Vietnam to Hong Kong with the journey from France? It's 20 miles, God knows how many miles it is from uh, it's Vietnam, 1,000 miles is it mm. to Hong Kong? Yeah. It's not going to be far really. to France, it's quite a few hundreds of miles. Yeah, you get to France for sure, yeah. Okay, we'll take one last question, guys. Can I ask what happened yes. to the boats? Yes, hang on a minute. Sorry. Mm. What happened to the boats they came in? The, the, they were all scrapped. Everything was scrapped. Everything. Um, the, the metal boats, the freighters, were all scrapped for, and sold for, 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 um, for scrap, for metal. And the wooden boats were all burnt. All of them. I mean, we ended up with the, the marine police bases, there are four marine police bases around Hong Kong. Um, you would end up with 30, 40, 50, 60 wooden boats all sinking, because a lot of them would just sink when, you know, when you're being towed in. Um, and the government made a, 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 an order, OK, look, if everything's been taken off, if there's nothing worth, if they've taken all their possessions off, just burn the whole thing. So they're all burnt. Not sunk, burnt. You know, there's nothing left as far as I'm aware. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up there for the sake of Facebook and everything else. And thank Les for doing a brilliant job today. This is his book. So this is Les's book, Along the Southern Boundary. And it's available here today, $180. And if you're good to Les, maybe he'll sign it for you. <laughs> if might, you're not, might. you might not. <laughs> if you can get me a... No, you not. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. Thanks very much for coming, guys. All the best. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Merry, Thank Christmas. You. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas.